you have your Bibles there, turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you several questions today. In fact, I think I'm going to probably cause more questions than I'm going to give answers today. And I'm probably going to leave you with some questions when you go home today. And all I want you to do is promise me that when you go home and you talk about these questions, that you don't argue with your spouse about your questions. Because I think there are some of the things we're going to talk about today that husbands and wives, friends, brothers and sisters, fellow church members disagree about. And that's okay. We've talked about that in the last couple weeks about how to disagree correctly and how to love each other and put God first in the middle of those disagreements. Amen? And now today we're going to talk a little bit about stubbornness. Anybody anybody so stubborn that you won't raise your hand right now and tell me you're stubborn? Some people are not. I see one wife trying to put up the arm of her husband trying to. Yeah, some of us are stubborn. I say some of us because I... I can be stubborn sometimes. I think there are probably times in which we all are stubborn at one point or another. And Paul suffered from a little bit of stubbornness. But you know, sometimes God is working in the most unbelievable ways. You remember the old expression, you know, that, you know, he works in, God works in mysterious ways. It is still true, amen? Our God is an amazing God. Would you stand with me? We're going to read Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. And we're going to see what happened when when Paul had a little stubbornness. uh, That he came to, he kind of came out, he snapped out of it, and he saw God working in mysterious and unbelievable ways. Verse 1, and and he came also to Derbe and to Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted this man to go with him on this second missionary journey. That's where he's at. And he took him and he circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So not Jewish, right? Now, while they were Passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles. Remember back at the Jerusalem conference? Um, And the elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. And so the churches were being strengthened in the faith, and they were increasing in numbers daily. And they passed through Phrygian and the Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia even though that's where Paul wanted to go. And when they had come to Messiah, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Paul is trying to go into these places, and the Holy Spirit keeps saying, no, no, no. And passing through Maestra, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course. Catch that? A straight course. To Somothrace, and on the day of following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and we began speaking to the women who had assembled. And a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful in the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know you know these scriptures way better than we do. 
So, Lord, I just pray that you'd open our eyes to what you want us to see. Every single one of us, Lord, has different strengths, every, every one of us different weaknesses, different things we need to work on. Maybe we're stubborn, Lord. Maybe we're just not seeing where you want us to be. Maybe we just don't have a clear picture of your will for our lives. So, Lord, I ask that you would begin to reveal what your will is for each one of us, and then that you would give us the courage to see that will through, that you'd give us the courage to, to follow those convictions, that purpose that you've placed in our lives. And, Lord, thank you for loving us so much that you would use us. Lord, I, I don't deserve it. I'm sure everyone here would say the same. We don't deserve you using us, but you do. And so I say thank you, Lord, for loving us and being with us today. For it's in your very precious name. All God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. So Acts chapter 16 begins really at the end of 15, where we talked about last week where Paul and, and, and Barnabas have that disagreement about bringing John Mark with them. And so they've decided to go separate directions. Paul is going to go with Silas. They're going to be on their way to Syria and, and Cilicia, while Barnabas is going to take John Mark and go to Cyprus. And so the second missionary, what we call the second missionary journey starts. Now, remember, we have the hindsight of the scriptures, right? They don't. They're living it. They're in the moment. We can look back. They don't know that this is called the second missionary journey. They don't know we're going to look back on this, and they don't know exactly what God has planned. He has plans, Paul being Paul, I mean, he has plans of where he wants to go, but, but he doesn't know exactly what God has in store. All he can do is prepare himself and be ready to do what he thinks God is calling him to do. And so in the first five verses, we, we watch Paul and Silas get into Derby. And when they do, they connect with a young disciple named Timothy. Now, Timothy, we recognize that name, amen, right? A couple of the books that are written to him faithful young man. Notice what this leader does. Notice that Paul, as he's going from town to town, he has no idea he's going to meet Timothy. But when he meets this young man, he realizes, hey, this is someone that I can pour into. Adults, that's our job. Amen. Looking around at the younger members, some of the younger people that attend and looking and praying about, Lord, who do you want me to pour into? Paul saw Timothy <clears throat> Paul had a, a vision of taking the good news throughout all of Asia. That was his goal. Little did he know God was going to say no to that. But that was his goal. He wanted to go to all of Asia and take the, the word there. And he runs into this young man named Timothy, but he doesn't think that, you know, that's beneath him. He's got bigger plans because he knows it's important to pour into fellow believers. That's still important today. Amen? We need to be praying about who God would have us pour into, who God would have us kind of, you know, take on and, and, and support. And even if it's just prayer, even if it's whatever it is, whatever you can do, Paul sees Timothy as someone that he can mentor. And so he, he wants Timothy to come along with him. Now, there's a problem with that because where did Paul always go when he first went into a town? He'd always start right in the synagogue, right? Because Paul, if anyone knew the synagogues, Paul knew the synagogues. Amen? He knew the synagogues. He would start there to see if he had some kind of, you know, connection with some of the people who were believers in God, in, you know, Elohim, right? And then he would say, he would try to get in there and he would help them understand that he's right there with them. He knows who they are. He's part of them. He was once part of them. I guarantee you they had heard of Saul. And then he would, he would start in those synagogues. Those are, those are you know, fundamental hard, strong, believing Jewish people who believed in their customs, etc. We've already seen how he had to, at the Jerusalem conference, come to an understanding, kind of a middle ground, right? Compromise. Remember that? A couple, three weeks ago in our sermon? Compromise. How important that was to find out a way where the Jews and the Gentiles could worship together, where they could feel like they were still on the same page. So when he brings timothy in with him paul runs into a problem the people know who timothy is they know that his mom is a believer she is a a good god-fearing jewish woman who's a believer and she keeps all the rules and the laws etc they they know that but they know that his dad was a greek 
He was an unbeliever. He was not Jewish. And so that, that, that presented a problem. And so Paul says immediately, Timothy, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to be circumcised because this is going to come up. It's an issue that always comes up. Now, you remember a couple weeks ago, Paul defended the Gentiles and said they don't have to be circumcised and able to, uh, in, in order to be saved. Remember that? Yes? Amen? Wake up, people. Wake up. Yes? You remember that? Okay? He just got done saying that in the last town, and here he's saying, you know what, Timothy? You need to be circumcised. And so if you don't dig into the scriptures a little bit, you might think, well, I think Paul's going back on his word. He's kind of, he's kind of contradicting what he was saying, but no. That's not the case because, you see, it's important for you to understand something. He, he sees this as, as a, he sees Timothy as a young man who has a great reputation. That's number one. And on your outline there, you see he had a great reputation. Timothy had a great reputation. He said, you know, I know we've got this problem with the circumcision, but you know what? He's got a great reputation. I want this young man to be part of my ministry. So let me pause right there for a second. Let me ask you a question. How is your reputation? When other people hear your name, what do they think about? What comes to mind? Someone might say that, you know, my reputation doesn't matter. It's what's really the case, what's important. I, I, get, I hear what you're saying. I hear you. Sometimes reputations, there's parts of reputations you can't control. Amen? You're not in charge of that. That's what other people think of you. But I will tell you this. It's what other people think of you that will cause them to either listen or not listen to you when you want to tell them about Christ. And so you got to do everything you can to protect that reputation. Timothy was in a bad situation having one mom who was a Greek, I mean, pardon me, who was a believer, a Jew, and then dad, who was a Greek. And so there was a conflict there, and yet Timothy kept his reputation pure. He was a, he was a good, strong young man. And so this issue comes up, and so Paul thinks, okay, now, I want him to be part of my ministry, but I can't have any stumbling blocks. I can't have something get in between my ministry, which is telling people about Christ, where did he start? Just said it a minute ago. He'd always start. Every time he went into, he went in with the Jews. He'd find some kind of common ground. Lots of times he'd get run out of town by some of those Jews. But some of those Jews would believe he'd find some commonality. He'd find a, a, you know, some agreement with some believers, and he would lead them to Christ. Then he'd go to the Gentiles. He'd try to lead them to Christ. And so he knew that if Timothy was going to be part of his little group here, his little entourage, if you will, that they were going to have a stumbling block. They were going to have something that would get in the way of fellowship with those Jews. And that was the fact that he has not been circumcised. And so guess what? He tells them, you need to get circumcised just so that people don't get hung up on this. Because you see, you say, well, it still sounds like Paul's going back on his word. No, he's not saying that Timothy had to do this to get saved, is he? He's saying that he needed to do it in order to make sure that there were no stumbling blocks, that there was nothing that would keep other people from listening to him. Now the Gentiles wouldn't care less. The Jews say, okay, that's taken care of. Okay, now I can kind of get over that because that is so important to their culture. It's very important to their culture. And so now there's no stumbling blocks keeping uh, Timothy from being able to witness. Because what is Paul doing? Paul's looking down the road. He knows that Timothy is going to lead, you know, he's going to be a witness for Christ. He's going to be a leader for Christ. And so if he's going to do that, you've got to get rid of whatever stumbling blocks get in the way. He's not saying that he had to get circumcised to be saved. He's saying this is a question of fellowship. This is a question of fellowship. It's not a question of evangelism. This is a question of fellowship. This is not a question of salvation. This is not going to get him saved. He's saying, listen, be, this is like what Jesus said, be what you can to as many people as you can so that you can lead them to Christ. Amen? Listen, if you go into another culture, you don't go into their culture and tell them to change their entire culture so that you can tell them about Jesus. Amen? You're not going to lead many people to Christ. What you do is you go in and you assimilate and you understand and you get part of that culture and you become part of their culture to the extent that it, you know, as long as you're not having to worship someone or something other than Christ, you just, you know, you get into that culture, you, you get to know those people, and then 
Once they see that you love them and that you value them and you have fellowship with them, then you can tell them about Jesus. Amen. You see, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of, it's like, what, it's like what James said at the Jerusalem Council. Remember? Remember? James stands up. They have done a, done, doing a lot of listening, which they did a great job of listening to each other, even though there was this really hot debate. Right? Remember that? And James, the half-brother of Jesus, stands up and he says, guys, listen. Here's the bottom line. You get saved through faith in Jesus. Amen? But there are some things that are just really important to Jewish people because it's part of their culture. And so we say to the Gentiles that while we're going to say you don't have to have circumcision in order to be saved, you should also respect your brethren, your Jewish brethren. And here's some of the things, here's some of the ways you should respect them. And in so doing, you show them that you honor them so much that you increase the fellowship, and now more people can be led to Christ. Remember in James gave those four things, like, you know, eating the animals that were bloody and those, those four things that were hang-ups for, for the Jewish people, right? They were not hang-ups. They were more important. They were important to them. They were very important things to them. Remember when James did that? It was just a couple weeks ago. Can you remember what we did a couple weeks ago? Okay. All right. All right. And so that's what he's talking about here, okay? If Timothy is going to be a leader of both the Jews and of the Gentiles, then he needs to put aside his own rights. I'm going to say it again. Does Timothy have to be circumcised in order to be saved? No. But can he do it? And if he does it, will he have the opportunity to lead more people to Christ? Then absolutely he does it. Amen? He puts away his rights for the feelings of others. He puts away his feelings for someone else's rights. He puts other people in front of him because that's what it's all about is leading him to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, he doesn't do something. This is not asking him to, to throw away something that is an essential it's not an essential. It's a culture. It's, a, it's a, an expectation in a, in a certain culture. But it doesn't ask you to, to you know, like worship a, an idol or something. You're not doing anything against God. It's just something that's very important. Every one of us has these things that we've been brought up with. And we've got to understand that those around us don't necessarily have those same things that we were brought up with, that they were brought up with. They're different. And that's okay. Amen? I'm, I'm thankful for our differences, aren't you? I said that a couple, three weeks ago. I'm thankful and we're not all the same. That would be boring. As much as I love Mike, I don't want 50 mics. I want one mic. Come on. Just one mic. That's all I can take. One mic. One mic. Listen, we, we, we got to enjoy those differences. So, so what I'm trying to tell you is, guys, don't let these hang-ups that you have don't let your preferences that you have, don't let stupid, insignificant, yes, that's right, I said it, stupid, insignificant issues get in the way of you fulfilling the purpose or the mission that God has for your life. Aren't you excited that God has a purpose for your life? Amen. Do you understand the God of the heavens, if you can look over this building, if you're too close, you can't, but if you can look over it, you can see some beautiful mountains back here behind me to the north. Amen? Beautiful. The God that created those mountains, if you can't see them, just, just imagine, real pretty mountains, okay? All right? The God that made those mountains thinks about you, specifically you, and has a purpose for you in your life. I, I want you to hear that. God has a personal relationship with you. If you've asked them to come into your heart, you have a personal relationship. So now, don't let some silly, insignificant things get in the way of you filling that purpose for your life because you should be excited about the purpose you have for your life. Now, if, if there's any point at which you ought to be saying amen or getting excited or waking up, it should be right now. You should be excited about the purpose God has for your life. Because God gave it to you. That's why it's exciting. And I don't care what it is. You say, okay. All right, so okay. I'm excited about the purpose God has for me. Okay, Pastor, I got it. I got it. 
What kind of things could get in the way? What are some of those, you just used the word stupid, Pastor. That, that's kind of dangerous. Okay, let me just tell, let me share with you a few things that are silly, and there's no reason for us to lose fellowship over these preferences, because that's what they are, preferences. I remember, number one, it's always number one, because I grew up in the 80s, okay? And I remember the big thing between kids and parents was the length of my hair. You remember those days? And I would come to church, and my mom and dad, they would fight me all week because I wanted my hair long. And my mom and dad wanted it short. And I would do whatever it took to hide it, to make it look shorter, so mom and dad, dad basically, would not make me go get a haircut. But then when the kids were around, I'd make it a little longer. And when there was parents, I'd try to make it a little shorter. I had curly hair. It worked sometimes. Okay. Let me tell you something. Some of us prefer it short. Some of us prefer it long. People, it's hair. Get over it. Some of us have no hair. Does that make them any less of a person? Jesus died for the bald. All the bald men said amen. Amen. Jesus died for the ones with a bunch of hair. God, I mean, Jesus died for all of them. It's hair. Get over it. You say, that's the way I was raised. That's fine. I'm not saying you were raised wrong. That's your preference. By all means, please do it your way. Do it the way that you feel you are comfortable with the Holy Spirit. Amen? I I do not want to have any say into how you comb your hair. I do not care. Okay? I don't care. Here's another one. How about music? How many Christians fight and split over music? Boy, oh boy. It got really quiet, didn't it? All of a sudden, I can hear the cars drive by. Yeah. People, every one of us has a favorite type of music. Right? Every one of us. And I will bet you it has something to do with how you were brought up, or in my case, what era I was brought up, or in my case, what my dad was listening to. That's all I could listen to. He was the one controlling the radio. I didn't have much choice. Back in those days, we didn't have iPods and all that stuff. MP3s and all that. We had, we had remember, eight tracks? Okay? I remember eight tracks. All right? I remember 33s and 78. Remember records, vinyl? Those have come back in style. Listen, we all have a preference of what kind of music we like every one of us probably has a different radio station we kind of you know revert to when we're by ourselves in the car let me just tell you something um as long as you're doing what god's called you to do i don't care what kind of music you're listening to it's irrelevant do what god's called you to do amen do what god's called you to do how about clothes yeah clothes we get hung up over that sometimes real silly Here's one, and it's serious because it gets pretty serious sometimes. Uh, Bible version. Mm -mm. Oh, boy. Christians fight over a version of the Bible. And I want you to, and I I know you're going to say, but pastor, be careful now because we're talking about inherency. We're talking about truth. We're talking about, okay, well, if if inherency is really important to you, then you'd better go learn Greek and Hebrew. And if you haven't gone and learned Greek and Hebrew, then stop. Because it's not that important to you. You're trusting some version. Whether it's King James, which is like the fifth version, or whether it's the new King James, or whether it's whatever it is. Okay? It, all you gotta, if you want to attack one version of the Bible, just get online, and you can find a group of people that you can all get together with, and you can all attack one version of the Bible all together. Misery loves company, I guess. Okay? There is no way that God would be okay with us setting a bad example for our unbelievers because we can't decide on what version of the Bible we prefer. Amen? Yep. Leading people to Christ is more important. Get over it. Get over it. Okay? Oh, boy, here comes one. Well, you may want to check your shoes because it may, they, you, I may be stepping on your toes, so be careful. How about drinking alcohol? Boy, Christians can really fight about that, can't they? Right? 
Different opinions, different verses, interpreted different ways. Listen, I don't care what your opinion is on those verses. If it causes you to stumble and a non-Christian sees Christians fighting over something like that, they decide, listen, I don't want anything to do with this Christian stuff. If you're going to fight over beer, to beer or not to beer, that is the question, then you know what? I don't want anything to do with this Christian stuff. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's silly. They look at that like it's goofy. They look at that like, why would I even want to be part of that? There's no reason to be fighting over stuff like that. How about instruments? Let me, let me, let me just give you an example. If, if you don't like drums, that's fine. You don't have to like drums. But if you allow drums to keep you from getting to know Aaron, who is one of the nicest kids that ever walked the face of the earth, then, then it's your loss. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you hear what I'm saying, people? It's okay for you to like drums or not like drums or guitars or whatever you like. I don't know what you like. I don't care what you like. It should not get in the way of telling people about Jesus. Amen? It's okay. I am glad that we have different opinions and we have different kinds of music that we like and we have different hairstyles and we have different clothes and we have different whatever. I'm glad we have that stuff. Amen? I'm glad we have that stuff. Boy, makes for a lot more beautiful crowd when we all look different, have different things we wear, etc. I'm just thankful for God how he blesses us like that, okay? Think about this. When someone does something wrong, I posted this on my social media earlier this week just to kind of see what kind of response I would get when I found it. When someone does something wrong, sometimes we focus on the thing they do wrong rather than how God views that person. And that's dangerous. You hear what I'm saying? If I, if I see Laura, I'm going to let Mike, I'm going to give Mike a break for once here. If I see Laura, she's hiding behind the television, okay? If I, if I see Laura do something wrong, I now have to, not that Laura does much wrong. She's almost perfect, right, Laura? She's laughing, okay. Um, <clears throat> When Laura does something wrong, if I see that, now I have to respond the way God would want me to respond. Amen? And to do that, I don't want to focus on what she did wrong. I want to focus on how God looks at her. How does God view her? I'll tell you how God views her. He would have died on the cross for Laura if she was the only sinner that ever walked on the face of the earth. That's how much he loves her. He sent his only begotten son for her. So that's how much you should love her, even though you disagree with her on something. Amen? So that's what Timothy was to Paul. He sees this young man. He pours into him. He realizes that he's going to have this stumbling block. And if it's not something essential to the, to the ministry, it's not something essential to, you know, believing in what God's word says or something, then just do it so that you can reach more people for Christ. That's what's important. Don't let those hang-ups get in the way. Well, and then in verses 6 through 10, it says that Paul really wanted to go to Asia. He'd been wanting to go to Asia. That was his dream. That was his, that was his, he felt like that was his calling. He felt like that's where God wanted him to go. But the Holy Spirit says no. Because, see, sometimes we have the best plan. Sometimes we have plans that we think make so much sense. Amen? Something makes so much sense to us. We're like, well, that's got to be what God wants. And, and then one time after another, doors just keep closing. Doors just keep closing. And you're like, but, but God, doesn't God see that this, I have this perfect plan? Doesn't God see that I have this perfect plan ready? I'm, I'm, I've got all these great plans ahead. God says, that's, that's fine, but that's not my plan. Because, see, God's plans are always better than our plans. Amen? Amen. And in verse 6 and in verse 7, the Holy Spirit flat out says no to Paul. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. When we pray, the Holy Spirit answers one of three things. He either says yes, or he says, well, wait, or he says no. Amen? And I'm going to tell you something right now. I think sometimes, sometimes, we just were not listening. We're saying that we're asking God for his opinion on something But we're really not listening. We're doing a lot of talking. You ever talk to somebody like that? You're doing this talking, and you can hear from what they were saying. I was in the gym this morning, and this man asked me. He saw I had Calvary Baptist football on my shirt. 
okay? And he said, where's that? And I said, well, it's literally like two minutes away, you know? Two minutes away from here. Oh, okay. And he says, does your son play? I said, well, my son graduated several years ago. And then he says, oh, what position does he play? I said, my son graduated like four years ago. Oh, so he doesn't play. Literally, he asked me three times. And at some point, I'm like, either he has a hearing problem or he just doesn't care what I have to say. And that's us with God sometimes. We pretend like we're praying. We pretend like we're asking God's permission or asking him for direction, but you're not. You've already made your plans up. You are stubborn, and you've decided what you're going to do regardless of what the Holy Spirit tells you. Now, give Paul credit. He might have been a little stubborn, but he gets told no in verses 6 and 7. And then by the time he gets to verse 10, you know what? He realizes that it's important to just start listening and following God's plan because God's plan is always better than our plan. Always, people. you got to understand something. God always does have a plan. The question is, are you going to trust that plan? Are you going to stick to your stubborn ways, or are you going to trust God's plan? You say, but I totally understand why my plan makes sense, and I don't understand God's plan. When you find the Bible verse that tells me that you have to understand God's plan, then that'll be a good argument. But our God is not an ordinary God. He's an extraordinary God. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So when he comes up with a plan, it stands to reason we're not going to understand that plan. Amen? Maybe he will reveal enough to us where we'll get it sometimes. But my experience has been, and maybe it's because God has a lot of stubbornness he has to work out in me, okay? Maybe I have more stubbornness than you do. But my experience has been, lots of times, he doesn't tell me what I'm going to do three, four steps down the line. All he does is reveal what I'm going to do next. Anybody like that? Because God is just teaching me to trust him. Just trust me. I have a plan, Lincoln. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. He has a plan, and we need to trust him. Why do we try to force our own desires? Why do we try to force our own, you know, wants and things into, into the, God's plans? Why don't we just let God's plans happen? Amen? How many times have you learned the hard way? Man, if I had just listened to God to begin with, um, a lot of these lessons I just had to learn, I wouldn't have had to learn. Amen? How many times have you seen our kids making some of the same mistakes we made. And they end up having to make those mistakes because they won't listen to us, even though we already made some of those mistakes. Listen, we're just as bad. We've got to trust God. He always has a plan. I wonder if part of our problem is that either we're just poor at recognizing God's will for our lives. Maybe that's it, right? Maybe we're just poor at recognizing God's will for for our lives. Or maybe the problem is we just don't really care what God's will is for our lives. And that's a tough question you need to ask yourself today. I told you I was going to ask you some questions today that there's really, there's no simple answers to. and I don't necessarily have answers for them, but some tough questions you need to ask yourself. And that's one of them. Do you really want God's plan for your life? Or do you want your plans and you just want God to kind of, fit into your plans. I'm going to tell you something right now. Our God is too big of a God to fit into your tiny little plans. Now, our tiny little minds will fit into God's plans just perfectly. His plans are always what are best. Well, you come to the end of those verses that we read, verses 11 through 15. They come up on this story of this lady named Lydia. What an amazing story. What an amazing woman Lydia was. Apparently, her husband has died. She's by herself, but she is a businesswoman, and in those days, that is rare, okay? This is before the days of Kardashians, okay? So Lydia is ahead of her time, all right? This is, this is, this is Lydia. She is a woman who is she's breaking the mold here. She is a uh, rich woman. She apparently has at least two different homes, and she's selling purple Fabric. Now, purple was the, it was the color of, of Rome's, you know, royalty. 
And you can only get that dye to dye the fabric from these little creatures from the ocean that, by the way, God meant to leave in the ocean. That's why we don't eat. That's why I don't eat fish or anything from the ocean. It's all nasty. It has nothing to do with the sermon. I just thought I'd throw it in there, see if you're awake, okay? Um, and so that's the only way you can get it. And you got it from these little tiny little, you know, creatures, these little things. And, and, and it, you got to get a bunch of them, and it was very hard to get. And so it was very expensive. And she sold it, and she was rich. And she was a businesswoman. And, boy, she's just an amazing, amazing lady. And here comes another one of those questions that I don't necessarily have the answer for. I have an opinion, and I bet you there's, I don't know, 50, 60 of us here. There's, you know, another probably, what, 30 or so online, something like that. If you put those together, that's 80, 90. Uh, we probably have about 80 or 90 different responses to this question I'm going to say. I wonder how you view women in the ministry. I wonder how you view women's positions or roles in the ministry. Uh, my wife, my wife and I don't have, we don't have, we don't have fights. We have lively discussions, okay? And, and I, I, I could tell you three or four of them that stick out of my head. A couple of them are about movies where we totally disagree about what happened in the movie. And I leave the movie angry and she doesn't and I'm emotionally invested and she's looking at me like I'm nuts, you know. It's just a movie, Lincoln, get over it. And this is one of those where we've had some discussions about, you know, and we see things differently because we were raised differently. We were raised differently. And I wonder how you view ladies in the ministry. Lydia is quite possibly the very first convert in all of Europe. Okay? This is a special woman. She is amazing. Didn't matter what gender she was. This was an amazing person. And she is definitely a leader. She is hosting a church in her home. I mean, this is a leader. Whether she's a male or female or whatever she is, there's only male or female. I keep doing that where I act like there's more than two. Um, listen, she is a leader regardless of what gender she is. This is an amazing person. And it just, again causes me to ask the same question that I've been asking all along the last few weeks, whether it's kind of between the lines or whether I've been asking it just right up front. And that is, you know, where are you getting your opinions? Where are you getting your thoughts? Are they coming from the Holy Spirit? Are they coming from Scripture? Or are they coming because that's what Grandma taught me, and so, doggone it, if it's good enough for Grandma, it's good enough for me. I, I hate to tell you this. Grandma was a sinner. You see, you didn't know my grandma. Don't be talking about my mima or whatever you want to call it. I'm sure she was a fantastic lady, and I'm also sure she was a sinner. Grandma, I used to call, well, I called mine Mimi, and her mother-in-law was Mama. Okay? They're both sinners. Okay? Where do you get your opinions? This idea, this, this, this disagreement in churches today about the ladies, the woman's role within a church, is, is a, it's a hot topic. Amen? That's a hot topic. And it can cause some people to really, you know, get torn and get angry at each other. And I guess what I'm trying to ask is this. Is your opinion of that question, specifically about a, a woman's place in the ministry, is it based on your upbringing or is it based on God's word? Are you hearing me? Is it a cultural thing? Is it a thing, you know, sometimes, you know, we need to know why we believe what we believe, don't we? We need to be able to give a defense or an account or lead someone to Christ, this is the last point that I have for you today. Some of us have these opinions, and we don't really know why we have them, and we don't know where they come from, and we don't know what scriptures or what verses they come from. And do you notice that when Paul in the verses, I think it was verse uh, 12, 13, somewhere in there, I'm forgetting, I didn't write down where that verse was. Do you notice 
He was ready at any moment. He wanted to go to Asia, correct? He got told no. He tried to do it again. He got told no. He was going to lose that battle. Obviously, he was not as stubborn as I. I, I would have gone beyond two times probably. Okay? But he decided he's going to get going. And on his way, he runs into some ladies. And you say, okay, well, that's no big deal. You know, you ran into a ladies group or something. In those days, that was a huge deal. For a man to walk up on a group of ladies and begin to tell them about Jesus, that was revolutionary. You don't understand. Okay? You don't understand. That was huge. Because, see, Paul was ready at any moment to give an account. And this lady, Lydia, is an amazing woman because she humbles herself. She believes. And then it says that she got baptized. She follows it up in baptism. I got a question, another question for you today. How do you feel about baptism? Have you been baptized? You know, the word is baptizo. The word is the same for taking a shirt and putting it inside the, the water and making it soak in the water and the ink. That's what they would do. So if they wanted to dye it purple, let's say, they would put it in the purple dye in water and they would soak it really good, completely put it in. I don't mean to be rude, but they would not sprinkle the garment. They would take that garment and they would put it all the way in because the word is baptizo. It's all the way in, all the way out. See, baptism doesn't save you. If you're wondering what baptism is, it doesn't save you. When we have a baptism in here, it's not like I've got like some secret holy water somewhere. I don't. It comes from the tap. It's just regular old water. Okay? Sometimes I forget to turn the heater on, and it's very cold water. Sometimes, like the last time, those poor people that, that got baptized from the Spanish church, uh, the water was about 90 degrees, and it was 100 degrees outside, and I guarantee you, they were sweating in the water. It was regular old water. What's the point of baptism then? It is a way of obeying Christ and telling the world, I follow Jesus. I want to stand for Jesus. I want to show people I stand. I am on Jesus' side. And you might think that's not a huge deal now. Well, number one, obedience to Christ is always a huge deal. And he called us to be baptized. Number two, in those days, if you got baptized, you could get killed. Because you were siding with Jesus. Okay? Today, the worst thing that could happen is you can catch a cold because the pastor forgot to turn on the heater. Okay? So, you understand, it was a huge deal. And it just simply shows people that you are a Christian. That you're willing to stand for Christ. Are you willing to stand for Christ? Are you willing to tell people about Jesus? And if you are, are you ready to tell like Paul was? Paul was ready to give an account at any moment. He was ready to tell people about Jesus. At any moment, he was ready to tell people about Jesus. He had no idea he was going to meet this person named Lydia. In fact, if you look at the verses, and I can't remember where. If you, some of you are looking. You can remember better than me. I think it's somewhere around verse 13. The words in the, ver in the whole chapter are they, 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 they. And then all of a sudden, in about verse 13 or somewhere, 15, somewhere in there, it, it says we. Do you guys see that? It goes from they to we. Anybody? What does that mean? Well, that means that the writer was giving it in the third person, saying they, and then all of a sudden he says we. You say, okay, Link, I didn't realize we were going to have an English lesson. That's all the English I can teach you, trust me, okay? But I'll tell you this. This is Luke writing the book of Acts, yes? And all of a sudden... Paul, who had chose Silas, remember? He chose Silas when they had the disagreement with Barnabas. Didn't know. He didn't have a plan. He didn't realize he was going to be on the way to wherever the Holy Spirit was taking him, meet this kid named Timothy. And all of a sudden, Timothy is with them. And then all of a sudden, at the end of these verses, 13, 15, somewhere in there, Luke joins in. Because this is where Luke becomes part of the story. Paul had no idea he was going to be with Luke. You see, the Holy Spirit had a plan all along. Paul had no clue what that plan was. And before he knows it, submitting to the, to the Holy Spirit means that he's now with Timothy. He's now with Luke. He's now heavy into the second missionary journey. And these guys become critical. They become crucial in the second and third missionary journeys. Because God had a plan all along. 
God knew what he was doing all along. And I'm going to tell you something. When you submit to God's plan, he will bless you beyond measure. Now, you could be stubborn. You can be, what's the old expression? Stubborn as a mule. Right? You could be stubborn. And I'm going to tell you something. God's still going to get his way. So it's up to you whether you, you give in now or whether you give in later. My advice to you from personal experience, give in now to God's will for your life now. I, I, I changed professions. Right? I changed my calling. I felt God calling me, and I became a pastor. And, and um, boy, it was 04. So that's, what is that? 16 years ago. 16 years. Holy moly. 16 years ago, but up until that time, I had no idea. Well, let me change that. There were a couple few years there, three, four years. I knew, but I was fighting it. I was fighting it. I was fighting it. I was coming up with every excuse in the book. And I'm here to tell you today, God wins. And, and I suggest you give in to his will right now. Because it will be the greatest decision you have ever made. When you give in to his will, you'll be ready to give an account. Paul was ready to give an account. He was ready at any moment's notice. And that's the last question I want to ask you. Are you ready? Could you share with someone how to get saved if you had to? If somebody in your life didn't have Jesus as their Savior, could you lead them to Christ? Do you understand someone's eternal destiny may be in your hands? God may be giving you the responsibility. God may be using you as the mouthpiece to share the good news with someone. And it could be the difference between them going to heaven or going to hell. These, these are serious stakes. Do you understand how serious this is? You have a mission. You have a ministry. You have a circle around you that God has put you in that no one else. Listen, Mike and I know a lot of the same people, but we don't have the same circles. He has a ministry that I don't have. He knows some people in his work that I don't know and vice versa. God has put him there for a reason, and he's got to be ready to give an account. Paul was ready to witness at any moment's notice. How about you? Are you ready? Do you understand when you go out to eat today? Well, I guess it's COVID times. It's not the norm. When COVID is over, let me give you an example. When you, when you go out to eat, when you get back to normal and you're sitting in a regular restaurant, do you understand? God may call you to share at any moment. You know what? He may still call you. To, it's not like you're not going to witness during COVID, amen? Okay, so when you order food and the DoorDash guy brings it to your door, be ready. I, I'm not saying you have to, like, stop them and get them fired because you give them the entire testimony right there. But listen, you, you could be a testimony in the way you talk to them and the way you treat them. Be ready to give an account. Be ready because God is going to call you to witness. All of us are, whether it's to one or whether it's to, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands, you know, from one person to like the Billy Grahams that witness to thousands and thousands. Be ready to tell people about Christ. There is no more important thing you will ever do then share the love of Christ with someone. Amen? Think about that. Are you ready? Where do your opinions come from? Are you following the Holy Spirit? Or are you kind of just going on what you think and your feelings? I'm going to tell you what. You trust yourself, you are going to mess up a lot. Trust the Holy Spirit, and he will never let you down. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as our musicians get ready to sing, Lord, I just thank you for... These words that you've given us, and I pray, Lord, that you spoke through my bumbling and messing up, and, and Lord, that you just really touched someone's heart here today. Every one of us has come today with different challenges, different needs, different wants, different hurts, different pains, different people that we are in their lives. And Lord, I pray that you would lay it on our hearts to really invest and pour into the lives of those people around us. Lord, they need us. They need you. Lord, I just pray.
If there's someone here that needs to ask you as their personal savior, if there's someone that needs to follow you in baptism or, or whatever it is they need to do, if they just need to pray, Lord, I pray that you would stir them, make a move, no better time than right now to make that decision for you. In your precious name, Lord, we pray.